An Odyssey of the North, an adventure story by Jack London. The sleds were singing their eternal lament to the creaking of the harness and the tinkling bells of the leaders, but the men and dogs were tired and made no sound. The trail was heavy with new-fallen snow, and they had come far, and the runners, burdened with flint-like quarters of frozen moose, clung tenaciously to the unpacked surface and held back with a stubbornness almost human. Darkness was coming on, but there was no camp to pitch that night. The snow fell gently through the pulseless air, not in flakes, but in tiny frost crystals of delicate design. It was very warm, barely ten below zero, and the men did not mind. Myers and Bettles had raised their ear flaps, while Malemute Kid had even taken off his mittens. The dogs had been fagged out early in the afternoon, but they now began to show new vigour. Among the more astute there was a certain restlessness, an impatience at the restraint of the traces, an indecisive quickness of movement, a sniffing of snouts and pricking of ears. These became incensed at their more phlegmatic brothers, urging them on with numerous sly nips on their hinder quarters. Those, thus chidden, also contracted and helped spread the contagion. At last the leader of the foremost sled uttered a sharp whine of satisfaction, crouching lower in the snow and throwing himself against the collar. The rest followed suit. There was an ingathering of backhands, a tightening of traces. The sleds leaped forward, and the men clung to the gee poles, violently accelerating the uplift of their feet that they might escape going under the runners. The weariness of the day fell from them, and they whooped encouragement to the dogs. The animals responded with joyous yelps. They were swinging through the gathering darkness at a rattling gallop. Gee! Gee! the men cried, each in turn as their sleds abruptly left the main trail, heeling over on single runners like luggers on the wind. Then came a hundred yards dash to the lighted parchment window, which told its own story of the home cabin, the roaring Yukon stove, and the steaming pots of tea. But the home cabin had been invaded. Three score huskies chorused defiance, and as many furry forms precipitated themselves upon the dogs which drew the first sled. The door was flung open, and a man, clad in the scarlet tunic of the Northwest Police, waded knee deep among the furious brutes, calmly and impartially dispensing soothing justice with the butt end of a dog whip. After that, the men shook hands, and in this wise was Malemute Kid welcomed to his own cabin by a stranger. Stanley Prince, who should have welcomed him, and who was responsible for the Yukon stove and hot tea aforementioned, was busy with his guests. There were a dozen or so of them, as nondescript a crowd as ever served the Queen in the enforcement of her laws or the delivery of her mails. They were of many breeds, but their common life had formed of them a certain type, a lean and wiry type, with trail-hardened muscles and sun-browned faces, and untroubled souls which gazed frankly forth, clear-eyed and steady. They drove the dogs of the Queen, wrought fear in the hearts of her enemies, ate of her meagre fare, and were happy. They had seen life, and done deeds, and lived romances, but they did not know it, and they were very much at home. Two of them were sprawled upon Malmute Kid's bunk, singing chansons which their French forebears sang in the days when first they entered the Northwest land and mated with its Indian women. Bettle's bunk had suffered a similar invasion, and three or four lusty voyagers worked their toes among its blankets as they listened to the tale of one who had served on the boat brigade with Walsley when he fought his way to Khartoum. And when he tired, a cowboy told of courts and kings and lords and ladies he had seen when Buffalo Bill toured the capitals of Europe. In a corner, two half-breeds, ancient comrades in a lost campaign, mended harnesses and talked of the days when the Northwest flamed with insurrection and Louis Riel was king. Rough jests and rougher jokes went up and down, and great hazards by trail and river were spoken of in the light of commonplaces, only to be recalled by virtue of some grain of humour or ludicrous happening. Prince was led away by these uncrowned heroes who had seen history made, who regarded the great and the romantic as but the ordinary and the incidental in the routine of life. 
He passed his precious tobacco among them with lavish disregard, and rusty chains of reminiscence were loosened and forgotten odysseys resurrected for his especial benefit. When conversation dropped and the travellers filled the last pipes and lashed their tight-rolled sleeping furs, Prince fell back upon his comrade for further information. Well, you know what the cowboy is, Malamute Kid answered, beginning to unlace his moccasins and it's not hard to guess the British blood in his bed, partner. As for the rest, they're all children of the coureur du bois, mingled with God knows how many other bloods. The two turning in by the door are the regulation breeds or bois brûle. That lad with the worsted breech scarf, notice his eyebrows and the turn of his jaw, shows a Scotchman wept in his mother's smoky teepee. And that handsome-looking fellow putting the capote under his head is a French half-breed, you heard him talking. He doesn't like the two Indians turning in next to him. You see, when the breeds rose under the reel, the full bloods kept the peace, and they've not lost much love for one another since. But I say, what's that glum-looking fellow by the stove? I'll swear he can't talk English. He hasn't opened his mouth all night. You're wrong. He knows English well enough. Did you follow his eyes when he listened? I did, but he's neither kith nor kin to the others. When they talk their own patois, you could see he didn't understand. I've been wondering myself what he is. Let's find out. Fire a couple of sticks into the stove, Malmute Kid commanded, raising his voice and looking squarely at the man in question. He obeyed at once. Had discipline knocked into him somewhere? Prince commented in a low tone. Malmute Kid nodded, took off his socks, and picked his way among recumbent men to the stove. There he hung his damp footgear among a score or so of mates. When do you expect to get to Dawson? he asked tentatively. The man studied him a moment before replying. They say seventy-five mile, so? Maybe two days. The very slightest accent was perceptible, while there was no awkward hesitancy or groping for words. Been in the country before? No. Northwest Territory? Yes. Born there? No. Well, where the devil were you born? You're none of these. Malmute Kid swept his hand over the dog drivers, even including the two policemen who had turned into Prince's bunk. Where did you come from? I've seen faces like yours before, though I can't remember just where. I know you, he irrelevantly replied, at once turning the drift of Malamute Kid's questions. Where? Ever see me? No, your partner him priest, Pastilic, long time ago. Him ask me if I see you, Malmute kid. Him give me grub. I know stop long. You hear him speak about me. Oh, you're the fellow that traded the otter skins for the dogs. The man nodded, knocked out his pipe, and signified his disinclination for conversation by rolling up in his furs. Malmute kid blew out the slush lamp and crawled under the blankets with Prince. Well, what is he? Don't know. Turn me off somehow, and then shut up like a clam. But he's a fellow to whet your curiosity. I've heard of him. All the coast wondered about him eight years ago. Sort of mysterious, you know. He came down out of the north in the dead of winter, many a thousand miles from here, skirting Bering Sea and travelling as though the devil were after him. No one ever learned where he came from, but he must have come far. He was badly travel-worn when he got food from the Swedish missionary on Golovin Bay and asked the way south. We heard of all this afterward. Then he abandoned the shoreline, heading right across Norton Sound. Terrible weather, snowstorms and high winds, but he pulled through where a thousand other men would have died, missing St. Michael's and making the land at Pastilic. He'd lost all but two dogs and was nearly gone with starvation. He was so anxious to go on that Father Roubaud fitted him out with grub, but he couldn't let him have any dogs, for he was only waiting my arrival to go on a trip himself. Mr Ulysses knew too much to start on without animals and fretted around for several days. He had on his sled a bunch of beautifully cured otter skins, sea otters, you know, worth their weight in gold. There was also at Pastilic an old Shylock of a Russian trader who had dogs to kill. Well. They didn't dicker very long, but when the strange one headed south again, it was in the rear of a spanking dog team. Mr Shylock, by the way, had the otter skins. 
I saw them, and they were magnificent. We figured it up and found the dogs brought him at least five hundred apiece, and it wasn't as if the strange one didn't know the value of sea otter. He was an Indian of some sort, and what little he talked showed he'd been among white men. After the ice passed out of the sea, word came up from Nunavak Island that he'd gone in there for grub. Then he dropped from sight, and this is the first heard of him in eight years. Now where did he come from, and what was he doing there, and why did he come from there? He's Indian, he's been nobody knows where, and he's had discipline, which is unusual for an Indian. Another mystery of the North for you to solve, Prince. Thanks awfully, but I've got too many on hand as it is, he replied. Malamute Kid was already breathing heavily, but the young mining engineer gazed straight up through the thick darkness, waiting for the strange orgasm which stirred his blood to die away. And when he did sleep, his brain worked on, and for the nonce he too wandered through the white unknown, struggled with the dogs on endless trails, and saw men live and toil and die like men. The next morning, hours before daylight, the dog drivers and policemen pulled out for Dawson, but the powers that saw to Her Majesty's interests and ruled the destinies of her lesser creatures gave the mailmen little rest, for a week later they appeared at Stuart River, heavily burdened with letters for salt water. However, their dogs had been replaced by fresh ones, but then they were dogs. The men had expected some sort of a layover in which to rest up, Besides, this Klondike was a new section of the Northland, and they had wished to see a little something of the Golden City, where dust flowed like water and dance halls rang with never-ending revelry. But they dried their socks and smoked their evening pipes, with much the same gusto as on their former visit, though one or two bold spirits speculated on desertion, and the possibility of crossing the unexplored Rockies to the east, and thence, by the Mackenzie Valley, of gaining their old stamping grounds in the Chippewyan country. Two or three even decided to return to their homes by that route when their terms of service had expired, and they began to lay plans forthwith, looking forward to the hazardous undertaking in much the same way a city-bred man would to a day's holiday in the woods. He of the otter skin seemed very restless, though he took little interest in the discussion, and at last he drew Malemute Kid to one side and talked for some time in low tones. Prince cast curious eyes in their direction, and the mystery deepened when they put on caps and mittens and went outside. When they returned, Malemute Kid placed his gold scales on the table, weighed out the matter of sixty ounces, and transferred them to the strange one's sack. Then the chief of the dog drivers joined the conclave and certain business was transacted with him. The next day the gang went on upriver, but he of the otter skins took several pounds of grub and turned his steps back toward Dawson. Didn't know what to make of it, said Malamute Kid in response to Prince's queries. But the poor beggar wanted to be quit of the service for some reason or other. At least it seemed a most important one to him, though he wouldn't let on what. You see, it's just like the army. He signed for two years and the only way to get free was to buy himself out. He couldn't desert and then stay here, and he was just wild to remain in the country. Made up his mind when he got to Dawson, he said, but no one knew him, hadn't a cent, and I was the only one he'd spoken two words with. So he talked it over with the lieutenant governor and made arrangements in case he could get the money from me. Loan, you know. Said he'd pay back in the year, and if I wanted, would put me onto something rich. Never'd seen it, but he knew it was rich. And talk, why, when he got me outside, he was ready to weep, begged and pleaded, got down in the snow to me till I hauled him out of it, palavered around like a crazy man. Swore he's worked to this very end for years and years, and couldn't bear to be disappointed now. Asked him what end, but he wouldn't say. Said they might keep him on the other half of the trail, and he wouldn't get to Dawson in two years and then it would be too late. Never saw a man take on so in my life, and when I said I'd let him have it, had to yank him out of the snow again. Told him to consider it in the light of a grub stake. Think he'd have it? No, sir. Swore he'd give me all he found, make me rich beyond the dreams of avarice and all such stuff. Now a man who puts his life and time against a grub stake ordinarily finds it hard enough to turn over half of what he finds. 
Something behind all this, Prince. Just you make a note of it. We'll hear of him if he stays in the country. And if he doesn't, then my good nature gets a shock, and I'm sixty-some odd ounces out. The cold weather had come on with the long nights, and the sun had begun to play his ancient game of peekaboo along the southern snow line, ere aught was heard of Malmute Kid's grubstake. And then, one bleak morning in early January, a heavily laden dog train pulled into his cabin below Stuart River. He of the otter skins was there, and with him walked a man such as the gods have almost forgotten how to fashion. Men never talked of luck and pluck and five hundred dollar dirt without bringing in the name of Axel Gunderson, nor could tales of nerve or strength or daring pass up and down the campfire without the summoning of his presence. And when the conversation flagged, it blazed anew at mention of the woman who shared his fortunes. As has been noted, in the making of Axel Gunderson, the gods had remembered their old-time cunning and cast him after the manner of men who were born when the world was young. Full seven feet, he towered in his picturesque costume, which marked a king of El Dorado. His chest, neck and limbs were those of a giant. To bear his three hundred pounds of bone and muscle, his snowshoes were greater by a generous yard than those of other men. Rough-hewn, with rugged brow and massive jaw and unflinching eyes of palest blue, his face told the tale of one who knew but the law of might. Of the yellow of ripe corn silk, his frost-encrusted hair swept like day across the night and fell far down his coat of bearskin. A vague tradition of the sea seemed to cling about him as he swung down the narrow trail in advance of the dogs, and he brought the butt of his dog whip against Malmute Kid's door as a Norse sea rover on southern foray might thunder for admittance at the castle gate. Prince bared his womanly arms and kneaded sourdough bread, casting, as he did so, many a glance at the three guests, three guests the like of which might never come under a man's roof in a lifetime. The strange one, whom Malamute Kid had surnamed Ulysses, still fascinated him but his interest chiefly gravitated between Axel Gunderson and Axel Gunderson's wife. She felt the day's journey, for she had softened in comfortable cabins during the many days since her husband mastered the wealth of frozen pay streaks, and she was tired. She rested against his great breast like a slender flower against a wall, replying lazily to Malamute Kid's good-natured banter and stirring Prince's blood strangely with an occasional sweep of her deep, dark eyes. For Prince was a man, and healthy, and had seen few women in many months, and she was older than he, and an Indian besides. But she was different from all native wives he had met. She had travelled, had been in his country among others, he gathered from the conversation, and she knew most of the things the women of his own race knew, and much more that it was not in the nature of things for them to know. She could make a meal of sun-dried fish or a bed in the snow, yet she teased them with tantalising details of many coarse dinners and caused strange internal dissensions to arise at the mention of various quondam dishes which they had well-nigh forgotten. She knew the ways of the moose, the bear and the little blue fox and of the wild amphibians of the northern seas. She was skilled in the lore of the woods and the streams and the tale writ by man and bird and beast upon the delicate snow-crust was to her an open book. Yet Prince caught the appreciative twinkle in her eye as she read the rules of the camp. These rules had been fathered by the unquenchable Bettles at a time when his blood ran high and were remarkable for the terse simplicity of their humour. Prince always turned them to the wall before the arrival of ladies, but who could suspect that this native wife, well, it was too late now. This, then, was the wife of Axel Gunderson, a woman whose name and fame had travelled with her husband's hand in hand through all the Northland. At table, Malmute Kid baited her with the assurance of an old friend, and Prince shook off the shyness of first acquaintance and joined in. But she held her own in the unequal contest, while her husband, slower in wit, ventured naught but applause. And he was very proud of her, his every look and action revealed the magnitude of the place she occupied in his life. 
He of the otter skins ate in silence, forgotten in the merry battle, and long ere the others were done, he pushed back from the table and went out among the dogs. Yet all too soon his fellow travellers drew on their mittens and parkas and followed him. There had been no snow for many days, and the sleds slipped along the hard-packed Yukon trail as easily as if it had been glare ice. Ulysses led the first sled. With the second came Prince and Axel, Gunderson's wife, while male-mute Kid and the yellow-haired giant brought up the third. It's only a hunch, Kid, he said, but I think it's straight. He's never been there, but he tells a good story and shows a map I heard of when I was in the Kootenay country years ago. I'd like to have you go along, but he's a strange one and swore point-blank to throw it up if anyone was brought in. But when I come back, you'll get first tip and I'll stake you next to me and give you a half share in the town site besides. No, no, he cried as the other strove to interrupt. I'm running this, and before I'm done, it'll need two heads. If it's all right, why, it'll be a second Cripple Creek man. Do you hear? A second Cripple Creek. It's quartz, you know, not placer. And if we work it right, we'll corral the whole thing, millions upon millions. I've heard of the place before, and so have you. We'll build a town, thousands of workmen, good waterways, steamship lines, big carrying trade, light draft steamers for head reaches, surveyor railroad, perhaps, sawmills, electric light plant, do our own banking, commercial company, syndicate. Say, just you hold your hush till I get back. The sleds came to a halt where the trail crossed the mouth of Stewart River. An unbroken sea of frost, its wide expanse stretched away into the unknown east. The snowshoes were withdrawn from the lashings of the sleds. Axel Gunderson shook hands and stepped to the fore, his great webbed shoes sinking a fair half-yard into the feathery surface and packing the snow so the dogs should not wallow. His wife fell in behind the last sled, betraying long practice in the art of handling the awkward footgear. The stillness was broken with cheery farewells. The dogs whined, and he of the otter skins talked with his whip to a recalcitrant wheeler. An hour later, the train had taken on the likeness of a black pencil crawling in a long, straight line across a mighty sheet of foolscap. Two. One night, many weeks later, Malmute Kid and Prince fell to solving chess problems from the torn page of an ancient magazine. The Kid had just returned from his Bonanza properties and was resting up preparatory to a long moose hunt. Prince, too, had been on Creek and Trail nearly all winter and had grown hungry for a blissful week of cabin life. Interpose the Black Knight and force the King. No, that won't do. See, the next move. Why advance the pawn two squares, bound to take it in transit and with the bishop out of the way? But hold on, that leaves a hole and... No, it's protected. Go ahead, you'll see it works. It was very interesting. Somebody knocked at the door a second time before Malmute Kid said, Come in. The door swung open. Something staggered in. Prince caught one square look and sprang to his feet. The horror in his eyes caused Malamute Kid to whirl about, and he too was startled, though he had seen bad things before. The thing tottered blindly toward them. Prince edged away till he reached the nail from which hung his smith and wesson. My God, what is it? he whispered to Malamute Kid. Don't know, looks like a case of freezing and no grub, replied the kid, sliding away in the opposite direction. Watch out. It may be mad, he warned, coming back from closing the door. The thing advanced to the table. The bright flame of the slush lamp caught its eye. It was amused and gave voice to eldritch cackles which betokened mirth. Then, suddenly, he, for it was a man, swayed back with a hitch to his skin trousers and began to sing a shanty such as men lift when they swing around the capstan circle and the sea snorts in their ears. Yankee ship come down to re Iber pull. My bully boys, pull. Do you want to know the captain ruins her? Pull, my bully boys, pull. Jonathan Jones of South Caholian A, pull, my bully. 
He broke off abruptly, tottered with a wolfish snarl to the meat shelf, and before they could intercept was tearing with his teeth at a chunk of raw bacon. The struggle was fierce between him and Malamute Kid, but his mad strength left him as suddenly as it had come, and he weakly surrendered the spoil. Between them, they got him upon a stool, where he sprawled with half his body across the table. A small dose of whiskey strengthened him, so that he could dip a spoon into the sugar caddy which Malmute Kid placed before him. After his appetite had been somewhat cloyed, Prince, shuddering as he did so, passed him a mug of weak beef tea. The creature's eyes were alight with a sombre frenzy, which blazed and waned with every mouthful. There was very little skin to the face. The face, for that matter, sunken and emaciated, bore little likeness to human countenance. Frost after frost had bitten deeply, each depositing its stratum of scab upon the half-healed scar that went before. This dry, hard surface was of a bloody black colour, serrated by grievous cracks wherein the raw red flesh peeped forth. His skin garments were dirty and in tatters, and the fur of one side was singed and burned away, showing where he had lain upon his fire. Malmute Kid pointed to where the sun-tanned hide had been cut away, strip by strip, the grim signature of famine. Who are you? Slowly and distinctly enunciated the kid. The man paid no heed. Where do you come from? Yankee ship come down to Iber, was the quavering response. Don't doubt the beggar came down the river, the kid said, shaking him in an endeavour to start a more lucid flow of talk. But the man shrieked at the contact, clapping a hand to his side in evident pain. He rose slowly to his feet, half leaning on the table. She laughed at me, so, with the hate in her eye, and she would not come. His voice died away, and he was sinking back when Malamute Kid gripped him by the wrist and shouted, Who? Who would not come? She, Unger, she laughed and struck at me so and so, and then... Yes, and then, and then what? And then he lay very still in the snow a long time. He is still in the snow. The two men looked at each other helplessly. Who is in the snow? She, Unga. She looked at me with the hate in her eye and then, yes, yes. And then she took the knife so, and once, twice, she was weak. I travelled very slow, and there is much gold in that place very much gold. Where is Unga? For all Malamute Kid knew, she might be dying a mile away. He shook the man savagely, repeating again and again, Where is Unga? Who is Unga? She is in the snow. Go on. The kid was pressing his wrist cruelly. The exhausted head dropped upon the table, nor could Malamute Kid rouse it again. It's Ulysses he said quietly, tossing the bag of dust on the table. Guess it's all day with Axel Gunderson and the woman. Come on, let's get him between the blankets. He's Indian. He'll pull through and tell a tale besides. As they cut his garments from him, near his right breast could be seen two unhealed, hard-lipped knife thrusts. 3. I will talk of the things which were in my own way, but you will understand. I will begin at the beginning, and tell of myself and the woman, and after that, of the man. He of the otter skins drew over to the stove, as do men who have been deprived of fire, and are afraid the Promethean gift may vanish at any moment. Male mute kid picked up the slush lamp, and placed it so its light might fall upon the face of the narrator. Prince slid his body over the edge of the bunk and joined them. I am Nas a chief, and the son of a chief, born between a sunset and a rising on the dark seas in my father's Umiak. All of a night the men toiled at the paddles, and the women cast out the waves which threw in upon us, and we fought with the storm. The salt spray froze upon my mother's breast till her breath passed with the passing of the tide. But I, I raised my voice with the wind and the storm, and lived. We dwelt in Akatan. Where? asked Malamute Kid. Akatan, which is in the Aleutians, 
Akatan, beyond Chignik, beyond Cardillac, beyond Unimak. As I say, we dwelt in Akatan, which lies in the midst of the sea on the edge of the world. We farmed the salt seas for the fish, the seal, and the otter, and our homes shouldered about one another on the rocky strip between the rim of the forest and the yellow beach where our kayaks lay. We were not many, and the world was very small. There were strange lands to the east, islands like Akatan, so we thought all the world was islands and did not mind. I was different from my people. In the sands of the beach were the crooked timbers and wave-warped planks of a boat such as my people never built. And I remember on the point of the island which overlooked the ocean three ways, there stood a pine tree which never grew there, smooth and straight and tall. It is said the two men came to that spot, turn about through many days, and watched with the passing of the light. These two men came from out of the sea in the boat which lay in pieces on the beach, and they were white like you, and weak as the little children when the seal have gone away, and the hunters come home empty. I know of these things from the old men and the old women who got them from their fathers and mothers before them. These strange white men did not take kindly to our ways at first, but they grew strong, what of the fish and the oil and fierce, and they built them each his own house and took the pick of our women, and in time children came. Thus he was born who was to become the father of my father's father. As I said, I was different from my people, for I carried the strong, strange blood of this white man who came out of the sea. It is said we had other laws in the days before these men, but they were fierce and quarrelsome and fought with our men till there were no more left who dared to fight. Then they made themselves chiefs and took away our old laws and gave us new ones, insomuch that the man was the son of his father and not his mother as our way had been. They also ruled that the son, firstborn, should have all things which were his father's before him, and that the brothers and sisters should shift for themselves. And they gave us other laws. They showed us new ways in the catching of fish and the killing of bear which were thick in the woods, and they taught us to lay by bigger stores for the time of famine. And these things were good. But when they had become chiefs, and there were no more men to face their anger, they fought these strange white men, each with the other, and the one whose blood I carry drove his seal spear the length of an arm through the other's body. Their children took up the fight, and their children's children, and there was great hatred between them and black doings even to my time, so that in each family but one lived to pass down the blood of them that went before. Of my blood I was alone, of the other man's there was but a girl, Unga, who lived with her mother. Her father and my father did not come back from the fishing one night, but afterward they washed up to the beach on the big tides, and they held very close to each other. The people wondered, because of the hatred between the houses, and the old men shook their heads and said the fight would go on when children were born to her and children to me. They told me this as a boy, till I came to believe, and to look upon Unga as a foe, who was to be the mother of children which were to fight with mine. I thought of these things day by day, and when I grew to a stripling, I came to ask why this should be so. And they answered, We do not know, but that in such way your fathers did. And I marvelled that those which were to come should fight the battles of those that were gone, and in it I could see no right. But the people said it must be, and I was only a stripling. And they said I must hurry, that my blood might be the older and grow strong before hers. This was easy, for I was headman, and the people looked up to me because of the deeds and the laws of my fathers and the wealth which was mine. Any maiden would come to me, but I found none to my liking. And the old men and the mothers of the maidens told me to hurry, for even then were the hunters bidding high to the mother of Unga, and should her children grow strong before mine, mine would surely die. Nor did I find a maiden till one night coming back from the fishing. The sunlight was lying, so low and full in the eyes, the wind free, and the kayaks racing with the white seas. Of a sudden, the kayak of Unga came driving past me, and she looked upon me, so, with her black hair flying like a cloud of night, and the spray wet on her cheek. 
As I say, the sunlight was full in the eyes, and I was a stripling, but somehow it was all clear, and I knew it to be the call of kind to kind. As she whipped her head, she looked back within the space of two strokes, looked as only the woman Unger could look, and again I knew it as the call of kind. The people shouted as we ripped past the lazy Umiaks and left them far behind, but she was quick at the paddle, and my heart was like the belly of a sail, and I did not gain. The wind freshened, the sea whitened, and leaping like the seals on the windward breach, we roared down the golden pathway of the sun. Nas was crouched half out of his stool in the attitude of one driving a paddle as he ran the race anew. Somewhere across the stove he beheld the tossing kayak and the flying hair of Unga. The voice of the wind was in his ears, and its salt beat fresh upon his nostrils. But she made the shore and ran up the sand, laughing to the house of her mother. And a great thought came to me that night, a thought worthy of him that was chief over all the people of Akatan. So, when the moon was up, I went down to the house of her mother and looked upon the goods of Yashnush, which were piled by the door. The goods of Yashnush, a strong hunter who had it in mind to be the father of the children of Unga. Other young men had piled their goods there and taken them away again, and each young man had made a pile greater than the one before. And I laughed to the moon and the stars, and went to my own house where my wealth was stored. And many trips I made, till my pile was greater by the fingers of one hand than the pile of Yash Nush. There were fish, dried in the sun and smoked, and forty hides of the hair seal, and half as many of the fur, and each hide was tied at the mouth and big bellied with oil, and ten skins of bear which I killed in the woods when they came out in the spring. And there were beads and blankets and scarlet cloths, such as I got in trade from the people who lived to the east, and who got them in trade from the people who lived still beyond in the east. And I looked upon the pile of Yashnush and laughed, for I was headman in Akatan, and my wealth was greater than the wealth of all my young men, and my fathers had done deeds and given laws, and put their names for all time in the mouths of the people. So, when the morning came, I went down to the beach, casting out of the corner of my eye at the house of the mother of Unga. My offer yet stood untouched. And the women smiled and said sly things one to the other. I wondered, for never had such a price been offered. And that night I added more to the pile, and put beside it a kayak of well-tanned skins which never yet had swam in the sea. But in the day it was yet there open to the laughter of all men. The mother of Unga was crafty, and I grew angry at the shame in which I stood before my people. So that night I added till it became a great pile, and I hauled up my umiak, which was of the value of twenty kayaks, and in the morning there was no pile. Then made I preparation for the wedding, and the people that lived even to the east came for the food of the feast and the potlatch token. Unga was older than I by the age of four sons in the way we reckoned the years. I was only a stripling, but then I was a chief and the son of a chief, and it did not matter. But a ship shoved her sails above the floor of the ocean and grew larger with the breath of the wind. From her scuppers she ran clear water, and the men were in haste and worked hard at the pumps. On the bow stood a mighty man, watching the depth of the water and giving commands with a voice of thunder. His eyes were of the pale blue of the deep waters, and his head was maned like that of a sea lion, and his hair was yellow like the straw of a southern harvest or the manila rope yarns which sailormen plait. Of late years we had seen ships from afar, but this was the first to come to the beach of Akatan. The feast was broken, and the women and children fled to the houses, while we men strung our bows and waited with spears in hand. But when the ship's forefoot smelled the beach, the strange men took no notice of us, being busy with their own work. With the falling of the tide, they careened the schooner and patched a great hole in her bottom. So the women crept back, and the feast went on. When the tide rose, the sea wanderers kedged the schooner to deep water and then came among us. They bore presents and were friendly, 
so I made room for them, and out of the largeness of my heart gave them tokens such as I gave all the guests, for it was my wedding day, and I was headman in Akatan. And he with the mane of the sea lion was there, so tall and strong that one looked to see the earth shake with the fall of his feet. He looked much and straight at Unger, with his arms folded, so, and stayed till the sun went away and the stars came out. Then he went down to his ship. After that, I took Unger by the hand and led her to my own house. And there was singing and great laughter, and the women said sly things after the manner of women at such times. But we did not care. Then the people left us alone and went home. The last noise had not died away when the chief of the sea wanderers came in by the door, and he had with him black bottles, from which we drank and made merry. You see, I was only a stripling, and had lived all my days on the edge of the world. So my blood became as fire, and my heart as light as the froth that flies from the surf to the cliff. Unga sat silent among the skins in the corner, her eyes wide, for she seemed to fear. And he, with the mane of the sea lion, looked upon her straight and long. Then his men came in with bundles of goods, and he piled before me wealth, such as was not in all Akatan. There were guns, both large and small, and powder and shot and shell, and bright axes and knives of steel, and cunning tools, and strange things the like of which I had never seen. When he showed me by sign that it was all mine, I thought him a great man to be so free, but he showed me also that Unger was to go away with him in his ship. Do you understand? That Unger was to go away with him in his ship. The blood of my fathers flamed hot on the sudden, and I made to drive him through with my spear. But the spirit of the bottles had stolen the life from my arm, and he took me by the neck, so, and knocked my head against the wall of the house and I was made weak like a newborn child, and my legs would no more stand under me. Unga screamed, and she laid hold of the things of the house with her hands, till they fell all about us as he dragged her to the door. Then he took her in his great arms, and when she tore at his yellow hair, laughed with a sound like that of the big bull seal in the rut. I crawled to the beach and called upon my people, but they were afraid. Only Yashnush was a man, and they struck him on the head with an oar, till he lay with his face in the sand and did not move. And they raised the sails to the sound of their songs, and the ship went away on the wind. The people said it was good, for there would be no more war of the bloods in Akatan. But I said never a word, waiting till the time of the full moon, when I put fish and oil in my kayak, and went away to the east. I saw many islands and many people, and I, who had lived on the edge, saw that the world was very large. I talked by signs, but they had not seen a schooner nor a man with the mane of a sea lion, and they pointed always to the east. And I slept in queer places, and ate odd things, and met strange faces. Many laughed, for they thought me light of head, but sometimes old men turned my face to the light and blessed me and the eyes of the young women grew soft as they asked me of the strange ship and Unga and the men of the sea. And in this manner, through rough seas and great storms, I came to Unalaska. There were two schooners there, but neither was the one I sought. So I passed on to the east, with the world growing ever larger, and in the island of Unamok there was no word of the ship, nor in Kadiak, nor in Atongyak. And so I came one day to a rocky land, where men dug great holes in the mountain, and there was a schooner, but not my schooner, and men loaded upon it the rocks which they dug. This I thought childish, for all the world was made of rocks, but they gave me food and set me to work. When the schooner was deep in the water, the captain gave me money and told me to go, but I asked which way he went, and he pointed south. I made signs that I would go with him, and he laughed at first, but then, being short of men, took me to help work the ship. So I came to talk after their manner, and to heave on ropes, and to reef the stiff sails in sudden squalls, and to take my turn at the wheel. But it was not strange, for the blood of my fathers was the blood of the men of the sea. 
I had thought it an easy task to find him I sought once I got among his own people. And when we raised the land one day and passed between a gateway of the sea to a port, I looked for perhaps as many schooners as there were fingers to my hands. But the ships lay against the wharves for miles, packed like so many little fish. And when I went among them to ask for a man with the mane of a sea lion, they laughed and answered me in the tongues of many peoples. And I found that they hailed from the uttermost parts of the earth. And I went into the city to look upon the face of every man. But they were like the cod when they run thick on the banks, and I could not count them, and the noise smote upon me till I could not hear, and my head was dizzy with much movement. So I went on and on, through the lands which sang in the warm sunshine, where the harvests lay rich on the plains, and where great cities were fat with men that lived like women, with false words in their mouths, and their hearts black with the lust of gold. And all the while my people of Akatan hunted and fished, and were happy in the thought that the world was small. But the look in the eyes of Unga coming home from the fishing was with me always, and I knew I would find her when the time was met. She walked down quiet lanes in the dusk of the evening, or led me chases across the thick fields wet with the morning dew, and there was a promise in her eyes such as only the woman Unga could give. So I wandered through a thousand cities. Some were gentle and gave me food, and others laughed and still others cursed. But I kept my tongue between my teeth and went strange ways and saw strange sights. Sometimes I, who was a chief and the son of a chief, toiled for men, men rough of speech and hard as iron, who wrung gold from the sweat and sorrow of their fellow men. Yet no word did I get of my quest till I came back to the sea like a homing seal to the rookeries. But this was at another port, in another country which lay to the north, and there I heard dim tales of the yellow-haired sea wanderer, and I learned that he was a hunter of seals, and that even then he was abroad on the ocean. So I shipped on a seal schooner with the lazy Siwashes and followed his trackless trail to the north where the hunt was then warm, and we were away weary months, and spoke many of the fleet, and heard much of the wild doings of him I sought, but never once did we raise him above the sea. We went north, even to the Pribilofs, and killed the seals in herds on the beach, and brought their warm bodies aboard, till our scuppers ran grease and blood, and no man could stand upon the deck. Then were we chased by a ship of slow steam, which fired upon us with great guns, but we put sail till the sea was over our decks and washed them clean and lost ourselves in a fog. It is said at this time, while we fled with fear at our hearts, that the yellow-haired sea-wanderer put into the Pribilofs right to the factory, and while the part of his men held the servants of the company, the rest loaded ten thousand green skins from the salt-houses. I say it is said, but I believe, for in the voyages I made on the coast with never a meeting, the northern seas rang with his wildness and daring, till the three nations which have lands there sought him with their ships. And I heard of Unga, for the captain sang loud in her praise, and she was always with him. She had learned the ways of his people, they said, and was happy. But I knew better, knew that her heart harked back to her own people by the yellow beach of Akatan. So, after a long time, I went back to the port, which is by a gateway of the sea, and there I learned that he had gone across the girth of the great ocean to hunt for the seal to the east of the warm land which runs south from the Russian seas. And I, who was become a sailorman, shipped with men of his own race, and went after him in the hunt of the seal. And there were few ships off that new land, but we hung on the flank of the seal pack and harried it north through all the spring of the year. And when the cows were heavy with pup and crossed the Russian line, our men grumbled and were afraid, for there was much fog and every day men were lost in the boats. They would not work, so the captain turned the ship back toward the way it came. But I knew the yellow-haired sea wanderer was unafraid and would hang by the pack even to the Russian isles where few men go. So I took a boat in the black of night when the lookout dozed on the forecastle head and went alone to the warm, long land. 
and I journeyed south to meet the men by Yedo Bay, who were wild and unafraid, and the Yoshiwara girls were small and bright like steel, and good to look upon. But I could not stop, for I knew that Unga rolled on the tossing floor by the rookeries of the north. The men by Yedo Bay had met from the ends of the earth, and had neither gods nor homes sailing under the flag of the Japanese. And with them I went to the rich beaches of Copper Island, where our salt piles became high with skins. And in that silent sea we saw no man till we were ready to come away. Then one day the fog lifted on the edge of a heavy wind, and there jammed down upon us a schooner with close in her wake the cloudy funnels of a Russian man of war. We fled away on the beam of the wind, with the schooner jamming still closer and plunging ahead three feet to our two. And upon her poop was the man with the mane of the sea lion, pressing the rails under with the canvas and laughing in his strength of life. And Unga was there. I knew her on the moment, but he sent her below when the cannons began to talk across the sea. As I say, with three feet to our two, till we saw the rudder lift green at every jump, and I swinging onto the wheel and cursing with my back to the Russian shot, for we knew he had it in mind to run before us, that he might get away while we were caught, and they knocked our masts out of us till we dragged into the wind like a wounded gull, but he went on over the edge of the skyline, he and Unga. What could we? The fresh hides spoke for themselves, so they took us to a Russian port, and after that to a lone country, where they set us to work in the mines to dig salt, and some died, and, and some did not die. Nas swept the blanket from his shoulders, disclosing the gnarled and twisted flesh, marked with the unmistakable striations of the knout. Prince hastily covered him, for it was not nice to look upon. We were there a weary time, and sometimes men got away to the south, but they always came back. So, when we who hailed from Yedo Bay rose in the night and took the guns from the guards, we went to the north, and the land was very large, with plains, soggy with water and great forests. And the cold came, with much snow on the ground, and no man knew the way. Weary months we journeyed through the endless forest, I do not remember now, for there was little food, and often we lay down to die. But at last we came to the cold sea, and but three were left to look upon it. One had shipped from Yedo as captain, and he knew in his head the lay of the great lands, and of the place where men may cross from one to the other on the ice. And he led us, I do not know, it was so long, till there were but two. When we came to that place, we found five of the strange people which live in that country, and they had dogs and skins, and we were very poor. We fought in the snow till they died, and the captain died, and the dogs and skins were mine. Then I crossed on the ice, which was broken, and once I drifted till a gale from the west put me upon the shore. And after that, Golovin Bay, Pastilic, and the priest, then south, south to the warm sunlands where first I wandered. But the sea was no longer fruitful, and those who went upon it after the seal went to little profit and great risk. The fleets scattered, and the captains and the men had no word of those I sought. So I turned away from the ocean which never rests, and went among the lands, where the trees, the houses, and the mountains sit always in one place, and do not move. I journeyed far, and came to learn many things, even to the way of reading and writing from books. It was well I should do this, for it came upon me that Unga must know these things, and that some day, when the time was met, we, you understand, when the time was met. So I drifted, like those little fish which raise a sail to the wind but cannot steer, but my eyes and my ears were open always, and I went among men who travelled much, for I knew they had but to see those I sought to remember. At last there came a man, fresh from the mountains, with pieces of rock in which the free gold stood to the size of peas, and he had heard, he had met, he knew them. They were rich, he said, and lived in the place where they drew the gold from the ground. It was in a wild country, and very far away, 
But in time I came to the camp, hidden between the mountains, where men worked night and day, out of the sight of the sun. Yet the time was not come. I listened to the talk of the people. He had gone away, they had gone away, to England, it was said, in the matter of bringing men with much money together to form companies. I saw the house they had lived in, more like a palace, such as one sees in the old countries. In the night time, I crept in through a window that I might see in what manner he treated her. I went from room to room, and in such way thought kings and queens must live. It was all so very good. And they all said he treated her like a queen, and many marvelled as to what breed of woman she was, for there was other blood in her veins, and she was different from the women of Akatan, and no one knew her for what she was. I, she was a queen, but I was a chief, and the son of a chief, and I had paid for her an untold price of skin and boat and bead. But why so many words? I was a sailorman, and knew the way of the ships on the seas. I followed to England, and then to other countries. Sometimes I heard of them by word of mouth, sometimes I read of them in the papers, yet never once could I come by them, for they had much money and travelled fast while I was a poor man. Then came trouble upon them, and their wealth slipped away one day like a curl of smoke. The papers were full of it at the time, but after that nothing was said, and I knew they had gone back where more gold could be got from the ground. They had dropped out of the world, being now poor, and so I wandered from camp to camp, even north to the Kootenay country, where I picked up the cold scent. They had come and gone, some said this way, and some that, and still others that they had gone to the country of the Yukon. And I went this way, and I went that, ever journeying from place to place, till it seemed I must grow weary of the world which was so large. But in the Kootenay I travelled a bad trail, and a long trail, with a breed of the northwest who saw fit to die when the famine pinched. He had been to the Yukon by an unknown way over the mountains, and when he knew his time was near, gave me the map and the secret of a place where he swore by his gods there was much gold. After that, all the world began to flock into the north. I was a poor man. I sold myself to be a driver of dogs, the rest you know. I met him and her in Dawson. She did not know me, for I was only a stripling, and her life had been large, so she had no time to remember the one who had paid for her an untold price. So? You bought me from my term of service. I went back to bring things about in my own way, for I had waited long, and now that I had my hand upon him was in no hurry. As I say, I had it in mind to do my own way, for I read back in my life, through all I had seen and suffered, and remembered the cold and hunger of the endless forest by the Russian seas. As you know, I led him into the east, him and Unger, into the east where many have gone and few returned. I led them to the spot where the bones and the curses of men lie with the gold which they may not have. The way was long and the trail unpacked. Our dogs were many and ate much, nor could our sleds carry till the break of spring. We must come back before the river ran free. So here and there we catched grub that our sleds might be lightened, and there be no chance of famine on the back trip. At the McQuestion there were three men, and near them we built a cache as also did we at the Mayo, where was a hunting camp of a dozen pellies which had crossed the divide from the south. After that, as we went on into the east, we saw no men, only the sleeping river, the moveless forest, and the white silence of the north. As I say, the way was long and the trail unpacked. Sometimes, in a day's toil, we made no more than eight miles or ten, and at night we slept like dead men and never once did they dream that I was Nas, headman of Akatan, the writer of wrongs. We now made smaller caches, and in the night time it was a small matter to go back on the trail we had broken and change them in such way that one might deem the wolverines the thieves. Again, there be places where there is a fall to the river, and the water is unruly, and the ice makes above and is eaten away beneath. In such a spot the sled I drove broke through, and the dogs, and to him and Unga it was ill luck, but no more, and there was much grub on that sled, and the dogs the strongest. 
But he laughed, for he was strong of life, and gave the dogs that were left little grub till we cut them from the harnesses one by one and fed them to their mates. We would go home light, he said, travelling and eating from cache to cache with neither dogs nor sleds, which was true, for our grub was very short, and the last dog died in the traces the night we came to the gold and the bones and the curses of men. To reach that place, and the map spoke true, in the heart of the great mountains we cut ice steps against the wall of a divide. One looked for a valley beyond, but there was no valley. The snow spread away, level as the great harvest plains, and here and there about us mighty mountains shoved their white heads among the stars. And midway on that strange plain, which should have been a valley, the earth and the snow fell away, straight down toward the heart of the world. Had we not been sailormen, our heads would have swung round with the sight, but we stood on the dizzy edge that we might see a way to get down, and on one side, and one side only, the wall had fallen away till it was like the slope of the decks in a topsail breeze. I do not know why this thing should be so, but it was so. It is the mouth of hell, he said. Let us go down. And we went down. And on the bottom there was a cabin, built by some man, of logs which he had cast down from above. It was a very old cabin, for men had died there alone at different times, and on pieces of birch bark which were there we read their last words and their curses. One had died of scurvy, another's partner had robbed him of his last grub and powder and stolen away, a third had been mauled by a bald-faced grizzly, a fourth had hunted for game and starved, and so it went, and they had been loath to leave the gold, and had died by the side of it in one way or another. And the worthless gold they had gathered yellowed the floor of the cabin like in a dream. But his soul was steady, and his head clear, this man I had led thus far. We have nothing to eat, he said, and we will only look upon this gold, and see whence it comes, and how much there be. Then we will go away quick, before it gets into our eyes, and steals away our judgment. And in this way we may return in the end, with more grub, and possess it all. So we looked upon the great vein which cut the wall of the pit as a true vein should, and we measured it, and traced it from above and below, and drove the stakes of the claims, and blazed the trees in token of our rights. Then, our knees shaking with lack of food, and a sickness in our bellies, and our hearts chugging close to our mouths, we climbed the mighty wall for the last time, and turned our faces to the back trip. The last stretch we dragged Unger between us, and we fell often, but in the end we made the cash, and lo, there was no grub. It was well done, for he thought it the wolverines, and damned them and his gods in one breath. But Unger was brave, and smiled, and put her hand in his, till I turned away that I might hold myself. We will rest by the fire, she said, till morning, and we will gather strength from our moccasins. So we cut the tops of our moccasins in strips and boiled them half of the night, that we might chew them and swallow them. And in the morning we talked of our chance. The next cache was five days' journey. We could not make it. We must find game. We will go forth and hunt, he said. Yes, said I. We will go forth and hunt. And he ruled that Unga stay by the fire and save her strength, and we went forth, he in quest of the moose and I to the cache I had changed. But I ate little, so they might not see in me much strength, and in the night he fell many times as he drew into camp, and I too made to suffer great weakness, stumbling over my snowshoes as though each step might be my last. And we gathered strength from our moccasins. He was a great man. His soul lifted his body to the last, nor did he cry aloud save for the sake of Unga. On the second day I followed him that I might not miss the end, and he lay down to rest often. That night he was near gone, but in the morning he swore weakly and went forth again. He was like a drunken man, and I looked many times for him to give up, but his was the strength of the strong, and his soul the soul of a giant, for he lifted his body through all the weary day. And he shot two ptarmigan, but would not eat them. 
He needed no fire. They meant life. But his thought was for Unger, and he turned toward camp. He no longer walked, but crawled on hand and knee through the snow. I came to him and read death in his eyes. Even then it was not too late to eat of the ptarmigan. He cast away his rifle and carried the birds in his mouth like a dog. I walked by his side, upright, and he looked at me during the moments he rested and wondered that I was so strong. I could see it, though he no longer spoke, and when his lips moved, they moved without sound. As I say, he was a great man, and my heart spoke for softness, but I read back in my life and remembered the cold and hunger of the endless forest by the Russian seas. Besides, Unga was mine, and I had paid for her an untold price of skin and boat and bead. And in this manner we came through the white forest, with the silence heavy upon us, like a damp sea mist. And the ghosts of the past were in the air and all about us. And I saw the yellow beach of Akatan, and the kayaks racing home from the fishing, and the houses on the rim of the forest. And the men who had made themselves chiefs were there, the lawgivers whose blood I bore, and whose blood I had wedded in Unga. I and Yashnush walked with me, the wet sand in his hair, and his war spear, broken as he fell upon it, still in his hand. And I knew the time was meet, and saw in the eyes of Unga the promise. As I say, we came thus through the forest, till the smell of the camp smoke was in our nostrils, and I bent above him and tore the ptarmigan from his teeth. He turned on his side and rested, the wonder mounting in his eyes, and the hand which was under slipping slow toward the knife at his hip. But I took it from him, smiling close in his face. Even then he did not understand, so I made to drink from black bottles, and to build high upon the snow a pile of goods, and to live again the things which had happened on the night of my marriage. I spoke no word, but he understood. Yet was he unafraid. There was a sneer to his lips and cold anger, and he gathered new strength with the knowledge. It was not far, but the snow was deep, and he dragged himself very slow. Once he lay so long, I turned him over and gazed into his eyes, and sometimes he looked forth, and sometimes death. And when I loosed him, he struggled on again. In this way, we came to the fire. Unger was at his side on the instant. His lips moved without sound. Then he pointed at me that Unger might understand. And after that, he lay in the snow, very still, for a long while. Even now is he there in the snow. I said no word till I had cooked the ptarmigan. Then I spoke to her, in her own tongue, which she had not heard in many years. She straightened herself so, and her eyes were wonder-wide, and she asked who I was and where I had learned that speech. I am Nas, I said. You? she said. You? and she crept close that she might look upon me. Yes, I answered, I am Nas, headman of Akatan, the last of the blood, as you are the last of the blood. And she laughed. By all the things I have seen, and the deeds I have done, may I never hear such a laugh again. It put the chill to my soul, sitting there in the white silence, alone with death, and this woman who laughed. Come, I said, for I thought she wandered. Eat of the food and let us be gone. It is a far fetch from here to Akatan. But she shoved her face in his yellow mane and laughed till it seemed the heavens must fall about our ears. I had thought she would be, overjoyed at the sight of me and eager to go back to the memory of old times, but this seemed a strange form to take. Come, I cried, taking her strong by the hand. The way is long and dark. Let us hurry. Where? she asked sitting up and ceasing from her strange mirth. To Akatan, I answered, intent on the light to grow on her face at the thought, but it became like his, with a sneer to the lips and cold anger. Yes, she said, we will go, hand in hand, to Akatan, you and I, and we will live in the dirty huts and eat of the fish and oil and bring forth a spawn a spawn to be proud of all the days of our life. We will forget the world and be happy, very happy. It is good, most good. Come, let us hurry. Let us go back to Akatan.
and she ran her hand through his yellow hair and smiled in a way which was not good, and there was no promise in her eyes. I sat silent and marvelled at the strangeness of woman. I went back to the night when he dragged her from me, and she screamed and tore at his hair, at his hair which now she played with and would not leave. Then I remembered the price and the long years of waiting, and I gripped her close and dragged her away as he had done. And she held back, even as on that night, and fought like a she-cat for its whelp. And when the fire was between us and the man, I loosed her, and she sat and listened. And I told her of all that lay between, of all that had happened to me on strange seas, of all that I had done in strange lands, of my weary quest and the hungry years and the promise which had been mine from the first. I, I told all, even to what had passed that day between the man and me, and in the days yet young. And as I spoke, I saw the promise grow in her eyes, full and large like the break of dawn. And I read pity there, the tenderness of woman, the love, the heart, and the soul of Unga. And I was a stripling again, for the look was the look of Unga as she ran up the beach, laughing to the home of her mother. The stern unrest was gone, and the hunger, and the weary waiting. The time was met. I felt the call of her breast, and it seemed there I must pillow my head and forget. She opened her arms to me, and I came against her. Then, sudden, the hate flamed in her eye, her hand was at my hip, and once, twice, she passed the knife. Dog! she sneered as she flung me into the snow. Swine! And then she laughed till the silence cracked and went back to her dead. As I say, once she passed the knife, and twice, but she was weak with hunger, and it was not meant that I should die. Yet was I minded to stay in that place, and to close my eyes in the last long sleep with those whose lives had crossed with mine, and led my feet on unknown trails. But there lay a debt upon me which would not let me rest. And the way was long, the cold bitter, and there was little grub. The Pellies had found no moose, and had robbed my cash. And so had the three white men, but they lay thin and dead in their cabins as I passed. After that, I do not remember till I came here and found food and fire, much fire. As he finished, he crouched closely, even jealously, over the stove. For a long while, the slush lamp shadows played tragedies upon the wall. But Unga! cried Prince, the vision still strong upon him. Unga? She would not eat of the ptarmigan. She lay with her arms about his neck, her face deep in his yellow hair. I drew the fire close that she might not feel the frost, but she crept to the other side, and I built a fire there, yet it was little good, for she would not eat, and in this manner they still lie up there in the snow. And you? asked Malamute Kid. I do not know, but Akatan is small, and I have little wish to go back and live on the edge of the world. Yet is there small use in life. I can go to Constantine, and he will put irons upon me, and one day they will tie a piece of rope, so, and I will sleep good. Yet, no, I do not know. But kid, protested Prince, this is murder. Hush, commanded Malmute Kid. There be things greater than our wisdom, beyond our justice. The right and the wrong of this we cannot say, and it is not for us to judge. Nas drew yet closer to the fire. There was a great silence, and in each man's eyes many pictures came and went. The end.